Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart for sharing International Happiness Day with Marilyn and I. International Day of Happiness was established by the United Nations General Assembly. Imagine that, and it's celebrated throughout the world today on the 20th of March. If we're meeting for the first time, I am Lisa McKenzie, social business strategist, teacher, and eternal happiness seeker. I've read hundreds of books on finding your bliss, and I do not take the pursuit of happiness lightly. So when I first read the manuscript for Exhilarated Life, Happiness Ever After, I was simply blown away. I couldn't put it down. I couldn't wait to tell all of my friends, but the book had not yet been released. So I really held it close to my heart, reflecting on every morsel until finally I could share it with the world. And what better day to share this mine but on International Day of Happiness. So our goal today is to invite you and into this call and make this call interactive. So if you're listening to us live and have any questions for Marilyn, please post them on her Facebook page at Exhilarated Life. So that's facebook.com forward slash Exhilarated Life. And if you couldn't be here live with us today and you're listening to the recording of this call, go ahead and post your question to the Exhilarated Life Facebook page and Marilyn will gladly reply. Also note that if you're posting comments for this call on Facebook, on Twitter, on other social networks, the hashtag is hashtag Exhilarated Life Happy Day. So no spaces, all one world, one word. If we have time at the end of the call to take your questions, we'll be happy to do that. If not, Marilyn has promised me that she'll answer every single one of your questions on her Facebook page. So now it's my distinct pleasure and my honor to introduce you all to my friend Marilyn Harding, author, entrepreneur, and visionary in the fields of art and holistic lifestyle, who has used her bountiful life and career as a spiritual laboratory to distill the complexities of life into the simplicities of everyday happiness. The result is exhilarated life, happiness ever after. With people becoming more and more disconnected every day, we're really hungry and searching for truth and for true soul connection. From the very first paragraph of Exhilarated Life, Marilyn brings her stories to life with her beautiful antidotes, her wholehearted humbleness, and she really invites us to embark on our own journey to everyday happiness. As daily inspirations for her free spirit tribe, she shares her takes on famous and not so famous quotes through her 365 days of happiness which you'll find on her Facebook page and her Exhilarated Life website. Marilyn and her mate, Ethan, live between Ahina Island, God, I hope I got that right, Greece and <laughs> Los Angeles. And if I didn't, I'm sure Marilyn will correct me. So between Greece and Los Angeles, California, basking in love, sunshine, tasting Evos, and sipping on wine. Welcome, Marilyn. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's early evening for you right now in Greece, right? Yes, right here on Aikina Island. <laughs> and I must say, I'm looking out my window across the dark sea, and all I see is a string of lights along the island of Salamina. It's absolutely beautiful here. So greetings from Greece to everyone, and thanks, Lisa, so much for arranging this time together. And it's a beautiful time that we're going to have. So, Marilyn, in our many, many discussions about this call and about the book, we talked about the most common questions you're often asked about your work and writing Exhilarated Life, Happiness Ever After, and how you wanted to share those answers with our listeners. So let's jump right in, and let me ask you, what does it mean to be exhilarated? Well, Lisa, my own experience of an exhilarated life is to live every day with passion and enthusiasm. And you sustain this passion and enthusiasm by fulfilling your own potential in whatever talent or skill inspires you and makes you wake up anticipating each day. Because I love what I do, I can spend long hours on my computer writing because my enthusiasm makes the time fly. We each have our own unique talents and qualities, and there are no lesser or greater roles to play a CEO, teacher, carpenter, gardener, actor, or dishwasher. Each can experience happiness, pride, and joy of fulfillment, and each person is a necessary and intrinsic part 
of life itself unfolding. Being exhilarated is to understand that there is no master plan, but that we are aspects of the master plan itself unfolding. We are the evolution of consciousness, and as we evolve, we push potential ever before us. God or creation is us in our collective choices. The state of the world right now is the consequence of the collective thoughts and actions of centuries of our individual life, excuse me, of centuries, and our individual life at this moment is the consequence of our repeated thoughts and actions of decades up until this moment. So, Marilyn, we are, yeah. let me ask you, so every moment is a choice. Every moment is a right. choice to be happy or to be miserable. We could have started off the day horribly, and within minutes we can turn it into a beautiful day. All we have to do is make that decision because we're in control. We are in control, and if we realize that the world is unfolding, 100 years ago there was no airplanes, and now if you look at the map of the airlines, it's crisscrossing the, the globe. Uh, it's unprecedented change, but these all began as thought. Somebody made a choice. Somebody acted on a thought, and this is the most powerful creation that we have, and we're each responsible. The world isn't happening in spite of us. It's happening because of us. Right. And we're all works in a never-ending evolution of our greatest self, and we can be exhilarated in our joyful participation, no matter what level of fulfillment we may be at. We may be just starting on the path of fulfillment, and others may be enlightened. But each new day, as you said, Lisa, is a fresh page turning over no matter what. It's also to know that everything you require to fulfill your potential is within you right now. We embark on our own treasure hunt, and our clues are what makes us feel good and worthy, what makes us happy. And then you realize that you do not need anything, but you will continually develop yourself. You'll embark, embrace the challenges that instill confidence and competence. Ask me. I did my first video this week. That was a real (laughs) challenge for me. Every part of me resisted, and then I broke through. And it's the understanding that when you're aligned to the expression of your greatest potential, you invite synchronicity. And the more you rely on this law, the more it will manifest. At my husband's funeral nine years ago, two friends of mine were chatting. One asked the other, where do you see Marilyn a year from now? The second replied, oh, somewhere on an island in Greece writing a book. I had no idea of that at the time. Now, it took me four years, but the crazy synchronicity didn't stop there. The Greek man, Athan, who would many years later bring me to this island of Aegina, was inspired but in his youth by a statue at the National Gallery of Athens. It was a statue of Zeus, poised with a spear in his hand, perfectly balanced, a true example of the inimitable art of the ancient Hellenic culture. At age 16, it put him on his life path of dance. When he shared this story with me 40 years later, we were both dazed to discover that the full name of the statue was Zeus of Artemisia, the very namesake of my own company, Artemis Alliance, which I incorporated in 2005. And it's also to understand that an exhilarated life is a daily experience, not a destination. You take yourself lightly and you know each day is a gift of renewal and exploration. You're forever unfolding and the circumstances and people that you meet are all beneficial to your fulfillment, whether it appears that way or not. Some will power you forward and others will illustrate what you need to delete from your life. You listen to your deepest desires and they will invite you to do what it takes to develop your skills to express your unique potential. For instance, A good friend of mine wanted to be a writer and began commenting on a blog on a topic that interested him. He would stay up at night researching the answers to questions and engage discussion by sometimes being controversial. Eight months later, he was offered a job on this very easy and now a year later as a highly regarded, sought-out global expert in his field and as a book is about to come out this year. 
And finally, happiness and feeling good about what you do is your internal GPS to an exhilarated life. But your route is infinitely alterable. You can never get lost. I love that. Infinitely alterable. Again, coming back to choice. You can't get lost. Right. No. And you mentioned passion and enthusiasm. Those are two of my favorite words. I also love knowing that, you know, we're works in a never ending evolution. We can forever be in beta, as we say in my industry. Right. We can always be testing, trying things on and releasing what doesn't feel right. And for me, synchronicity has always been my guiding light. I know that when all the clues are laid in front of me and I start seeing things unfolding, I know that I'm on the right path. So I love those, you know, passion, enthusiasm, and synchronicity. So then, it's when it's effortless, effortless, Lisa, that we know we're on our path. And, and it's not difficult. It's not difficult to achieve happiness. It's not difficult to find the career of your choice or your, your passion. It's effortless. It's what is the least resistance. And that's one of the biggest clues. And because it's so simple, sometimes people just don't embrace that. And I can speak from personal experience. When it's too simple, I wonder, well, that's too simple. This is supposed to be hard. (laughs) This is supposed to be challenging. And yet, if we just gave in to that simplicity, then, you know, it would be simple. <laughs> and just yeah. like for us, when we were thinking about, you know, how are we going to share these words of happiness, these happiness truths? And, you know, and we found out that March 20th was International Day of Happiness. It couldn't have been easier. It couldn't have been easier to share your right. message with people. But on this day. It's always, well, we called it an auspicious day today, didn't we? And there's so many, so many things happening today, the solstice and the eclipse and everything. It's a pretty powerful day and exciting. So when you have these it's all affirmations from the universe, it's, I think, and I think we get them, I know we get them, and then you know you're on the right path. I love the right path. So hmm. what keeps most people from being happy? Well, first off, I think it's the belief that happiness is not achievable as a state beyond the momentary gratification of satisfying wants, that happiness is the result of material acquisition or personal prestige. Uh, We think someone or something else uh, can make us happy. And we think we need perfect conditions to be happy, that we can't change what others do in terms of personal relationship or global cataclysm. Neither can we change the weather or the spinning of the earth. What we can change is our response to these things. And my most profound shift came when I finally accepted that I was powerless against life and death and my husband was going to die. When I surrendered, the weight of fixing things or wishing them different than they were lifted. And I could attend to those precious days with a lightness of spirit that made them rich, even though they were sad. So happiness isn't, it, happiness isn't the absence of challenge or sadness. Happiness, the state that we're discussing in exhilarated life, is something that holds all of it together. We can continue to face challenges, but we face them with the lightness of the spirit and an understanding that they're helping us come to a deeper understanding of our role in life and our, and our own essential gift to the world. Happiness is most often sabotaged by an erroneous sense of unworthiness, unexamined scripts from others that direct our life choices. We can be influenced by social instincts to serve others of our own needs, conforming to cultural or religious doctrines despite our internal opposition to one degree or another. And we're trained to make and keep commitments and compromises We sacrifice our own happiness to please others, even when that does not necessarily and rarely makes them happy. When we were just in L.A. last month, we took a lift, which is a taxi, to deliver one of my books. In our conversation, I showed my book to the driver and commented that he seemed a pretty happy guy, driving, meeting new people, and engaging. He responded that he wasn't always happy. And he told us of his 20-year marriage of compromise and how he played the corporate game, but always wanted to be an actor. Even though he cut off all his desires to do his duty, his wife left him. He moved to California and is now an actor and is happier than he ever expected. 
He's not a star, and he had not even had his first speaking role. He had only worked as an extra, but his bliss was unmistakable. His only wish is that he can teach his daughter not to compromise for less than her heart's desires. Sometimes we come to this lesson pretty late in life, but at least we come to it. I know I did, and I'm glad I'm here because it's going to make the rest of my years on this planet rich and and thrilling and exhilarated. I think we're taught that it is selfish to put ourselves first in terms of our own happiness or that we have no right to be happy when those around us are unhappy or suffering. We're continually invited to commiserate, aren't we? How bad is it? We continue to talk about what's wrong in our life and expect other than that to manifest. What you think and take action on has to come to pass. We're lured into the idea that if we visualize, we can manifest anything we want. And that is true. Whatever we focus on and take appropriate action on will come into our life. But unless we engage in activities that express our passion... We might be momentarily satisfied, but we can never sustain true happiness. And finally, people just don't realize that being happy is as ridiculously simple as choosing to be engaged in what makes you excited, enthusiastic, and passionate. Follow your bliss, as Joseph Campbell said. Okay, so what if I I hear that? I believe it but I just I can't get unstuck well I think many of us expect different results from the same thoughts and actions we can't plant and nurture thoughts of frustration failure and anger and get happiness joy and bliss any more than you can plant tomatoes and expect cucumbers how long have we been taught you reap what you sow what did we think that meant we're stuck when we're clogged with misinformation and untruths that dictate our continued choices. We clear these out by choosing thoughts, feelings, people, and circumstances that make us feel good about ourselves. It's not our job to change what others say or feel about us, but these are not our truths. We have to let go of the attachment to our own drama. How many sentences do we start with, I can't, I'll never, I wish, I just did it this week with the, with the video, I'll <laughs> never get this right. How many times do people give up with the first attempts at change? We can't take a leap to fulfillment. It is a process of release of what does not serve us and integration of greater awareness. We gain ground with every success and re- success is labeled feeling good. A year or so ago, before the stories in my book began, I signed up for a practitioner's course in a very effective therapy. Three days before the weekend, I found myself curled up on the floor of my closet sobbing. I was sobbing for my brother who had committed suicide, for my own unworthiness, for my fear of my husband's illness. I was sobbing out my deep, deep sadness. In the opening comments, the first day of the workshop, the leader asked, Did anyone notice that after they signed up that things started happening to them to keep them from attending? Did did anyone have a meltdown? I had a big catharsis that weekend. And it was the same weekend that I wrote the letter to my future self from a Bougainvillea-covered terrace somewhere in the world, which story I tell in my book. The ego puts up a mighty fight for control. We resist change at all costs until we realize the cost to our happiness of staying stuck. We must realize that considering ourselves stuck or unstuck is really just a repeated thought. Change the thought. Choose another thought when a negative one comes up. Simply train your mind to see possibilities instead of impossibilities. We train our mind like we would a puppy on a leash. Every time he wanders, we gently pull him back to heel. No struggle, no reprimand, maybe a reward. But eventually the habit is made. It's consistency and vigilance. And sometimes when the pup is on a scent, you simply have to distract him. 
Einstein said you can't solve a problem with the same mind that created it. Thinking your way out of repetitive overthinking may not work as well as just distracting yourself with a funny movie or a good book to bring your mind back to pleasant equilibrium. Again, sometimes we think it has to be hard, and it isn't. I believe you start with the highest function of your own body, rest, nourishment, physical exercise, because when your body's stagnant, your thoughts can become stagnant and your energy is low. Getting free is a journey that takes a lifetime and starts with your first action to choose it. We must be willing to keep going. Like defragging a computer, we delete a file, but fragments remain undetected and slow down the works. We unconsciously repeat patterns of behavior or thought. Sometimes we let people go but hang on to residual guilt, remorse, or some other attachment that has gone underground and affects our outlook. And because of this, we get drawn into similar situations over and over until those fragments are resolved. Getting unstuck is keeping on, keeping on, and knowing that the process reveals you to yourself. You're already unstuck on the deepest level because your soul drives you into circumstances to achieve your freedom and happiness. And it isn't often elegant, as I will illustrate. Because Ethan was reminding me when I was writing about this of when I claimed my own power several years ago quite by chance. It was in the year after George had died and I was dealing with contractors to finish the house off to sell. The details of this whole disaster are in the book, but the story I don't share is one about one particular contractor of dubious background that became quite menacing to me. I was at my most vulnerable, and I would find this guy knocking on my bedroom door to ask a question about the work or appearing suddenly in the backyard on a weekend. One day he called. He said he was really mad, and he was coming over to talk to me. I thought he was kidding Within seconds, the doorbell rang, and I flung open the door, and thinking I was playing the same game, started shaking my fist and shouting, don't you come here threatening me. I backed him up all the way to his truck and kept shouting while he pulled out of the drive and sped away. And it was in that exact moment that I knew he had not been kidding, but had come to do me harm. Too often, we want someone else to do the work that we are meant to do for ourselves to be free. I could stand up for myself alone and unaided. I was no longer stuck in being a victim. And this changed everything. How I wish I was there on that day to watch you do that. That must have been so <laughs> empowering, so liberating. And, and you know, backing him up all the way to his truck, I can guarantee you, and I'm sure you'll say the same, was so much more about him and his truck It was about all the other people who had, you know, threatened you in some way or made you feel less than. So, yeah. he. he, So how often I felt powerless and guilty just because I was being shouted at. Absolutely. So a quick reminder to those of you who are joining us live or listening to the recording and have questions for Marilyn, please post them on her Facebook page at Exhilarated Life. That's facebook.com forward slash exhilarated life. And Marilyn would gladly reply. And if you have a question that's more of a personal nature, go ahead and message through the Facebook page, message Marilyn, and she will respond to your question as well. So Marilyn, I (laughs) go on with my day and I have negative thoughts and I always hear your voice in my head. Change the thought, change another thought when a negative one comes up. And I'm pretty successful at it, not all the time, um, but I like that I have your voice in my head. It just, it makes me feel good. So Thanks. another question that you're often asked, Marilyn, is, you know, what if, I'm, what if I'm depressed? What if happiness feels so far, far out of my reach? What do I do then? Well, I think we mistake, again, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, what uh, what happiness is. And happiness is a state we experience when we are in alignment with our self-expression in its fullness, body, mind, and spirit. When we are out of alignment, we suffer one way or another. 
we inevitably have ups and downs, like you just said. We have negative thoughts. And as the song goes, some days are diamonds and some days are stones. But sometimes depression persists. And there are many causes for depression, physical, psychological, and, and spiritual. Something is out of alignment. And we must be willing to explore which dominates the state of which, uh, or which, uh, which is deficient. Something is lacking. Sometimes we label and medicate what is a normal response to a traumatic experience. My mom was diagnosed as manic depressive, bipolar, but she also witnessed her father's suicide at age 14 when he called out to her. This always prompted my question of what constitutes effective treatment and how do we lead a soul out of trauma into peace? Too often our culture wants to dispatch awkward behavior by covering over rather than drawing out. And we have to understand that depression is an expression of our present holistic state and is the result of combined conditions. Be gentle with yourself and know that depression is an invitation to be whole. Take kind interest in your own process and release any judgment for your present thoughts and feelings. They are not your truth, but signposts toward happiness and fulfillment. Simply ask, what makes me feel better? You don't snap out of depression. You build a bridge out of it. And many states of depression are caused by or compounded by nourishment deficits, sometimes as simple as chronic low blood sugar, sleep deprivation, chemical imbalance, or environmental allergies. So find support for your body, your mind, and your spirit with trained and experienced practitioners. Start first on the physical plane and nourish your body, get sufficient rest, move your body in pleasurable activity, and take time to calm your mind. We all know that when we're tired, things loom large. Things are harder to manage than they were before. We can't respond in the moment when we're tired. And we have to realize that that is just compounded when many circumstances are impacting our our bodies our minds and our spirits so work with a doctor who understands your commitment to wellness and does not prescribe long-term addicting medication this is happening way too often as i mentioned earlier for things that need a, a greater understanding to release so engage in body work to move chemical reactions to emotional situations through your body to release them and to experience healing and loving touch Again, choose a qualified and experienced practitioner. In the years that my husband was ill, I made certain that all members of the family had some form of body work or treatments to help release the inevitable stresses that this emotional time would cause. Emotions get locked in our muscles. They get locked in our organs. They, they slow us down. They affect us energetically. So again, find practitioners, allopathic or natural, but who will engage with you to support your own autonomy of wellness. You mentioned something before about unexamined scripts from others that direct our life choice. And I'm going to say it again, because I think, I think that's so true. Unexamined living by unexamined scripts from others that direct our current life choices. Sadly, but sometimes these, you know, these scripts are so ingrained that we don't even know that it belongs to someone else and not to ourselves. So what about, you know, people who have no support and, and, you know, because they have no support, they feel like they don't have a choice. What I hear from many people is what do I do if my partner or say my family are not supporting me? What if, you know, you spend all your time trying to convince people of your truths and your gifts and you're just not getting that support? Well, you, do, you just have to come to the conclusion and the deepest understanding that you do not have to convince anyone else of your right to personal freedom and happiness. That's just being human. As you develop your sense of self quietly, knowing that you're already complete and will live by example and others will change as a reaction as you gain strength. 
When we're out of alignment with our right to happiness, we are caught in the mire of agreed responses and those scripts in our circle of influence. And often these are closest to us in family or career. And these are our greatest detractors because change is frightening. And they're all living by the same scripts. And if one changes, then it's like dominoes. Everything changes. And it's frightening because we choose our personal fulfillment. We can only achieve it by taking full responsibility for our actions and choices. And again, this forces others also to take responsibility. So many are caught in blame and self-recrimination. And this has become a comfortable numbing pattern and attracts others like a super magnet. Many times we do not communicate what we really wish to say with the result that we get angry and lash out about anything but what we want to talk about. And this escalates into non-communication, greater frustration, and a bigger gulf to resolution. Caveat to this is that you must be willing to accept another as they are and have their right to make their own choices. So we may make changes in our life, and that doesn't automatically make everybody else enlightened. They may just decide to stay stuck. This might mean that people will leave your life. It's your choice to be free or stay stuck when this happens. The sustaining relationships will shift with you, and others, based on mutual brokenness, will fall away. We stay stuck in the shoulds rather than pursuing our true calling or purpose. And our purpose is to be just who we are and not what someone else wants us to be. One of the themes of my book is letting go of the shoulds and oughts. And my biggest must was I have to make money to support my family after George died. So I kept racing down the wrong road in pursuit of money instead of the pursuit of happiness. I was ripe for manipulation by those who sensed my need to succeed. At one point, I took delivery of $350,000 worth of paintings in my condo gallery at the very moment that the artist was negotiating with another gallery against our exclusive contract. The artist dropped the bomb moments before I was to give a speech in an exclusive arts club. It was devastating. I was so deeply invested financially, I would never recoup that money. When our intention is self-fulfillment and we go down the wrong road, circumstances will smack us right out of that playground. Money will follow, but it cannot lead to happiness. And I learned that the hard way. I love that. When our intention is self-fulfillment and we go down the wrong road, circumstances will smack us right out of that playground. Okay, that's my favorite quote today. (laughs) I know. I might get get that tattoo. (laughs) You know what? I never thought I would ever have a tattoo because I couldn't find something that I would (laughs) love to look at every day. It's something, you know, whether I was in my 20s, which is no longer the case, or in my 70s. But that is a, you know, okay, so maybe not a tattoo, but at least a poster in my office. When our intention is self-fulfillment and we go down the wrong road, circumstance will smack us right out of that playground. Yeah, it's just an, an, just enough little Irish in there to get me to pay attention. <laughs> well, and, and the truth is, when life is difficult, you can be absolutely certain that you're bucking your own soul. That's a given. When it is effortless, you're on the right path. And I preface that by saying when your intention is self-fulfillment, you'll get knocked out of the playground because you've already set your intention. And so the universe, all the whatever you want to call it, is conspiring to send you to your mission to be fulfilled. If you don't have that mission, you can go down wrong roads all the time and just play out those those messes and the chaos of that. So coming back, when you set your intentions, when you truly desire change, when you decide that happiness is your set point, when you want to be exhilarated and you want to handle all the problems of life from a happy point or at least a point of creative um, decision making, that's when circumstances will be They'll be difficult, and then something will happen, and they'll be swept right out of your way. Not always without suffering a little bit. <laughs> Good point. Caveat. Um, 
yeah. Um, we always get in our own way or, you know, many times get in our own way. And who doesn't want to be exhilarated? Who doesn't want to be happy all the time? And yet we think that happiness may come with a price or happiness is something that we eventually achieve when we cross everything off our list. And it's just, right. you know, how beautiful would it be if we happily cross things off our list? Exactly. Now, because, you know, we've all asked ourselves this question at one time or another, whether it was, you know, to ourselves or to our friends, how does someone find the right partner to love them? Well, that is a good question. I think you you nourish self-love so that you feel worthy of the greatest expression of mutual love. I really think you should trust your instincts. If someone doesn't make you feel great about yourself, move on quickly. So many relationships I hear are, are relationships of suffering or compromise, and they never get better. When you're off your path and you're with the wrong person thinking they'll change, it ain't going to happen. And the sooner you dispatch that, the sooner you'll find the person who's looking for you. You've got to be willing, though, to be vulnerable and give yourself freely and completely when you feel like you're in a position of trust. Take time to get to know yourself so that you more clearly attract the one who will respect you and see who you are. Know that what you're looking for is looking for you. There is no one side to any equation. And desire the relationship that is mutually fulfilling and growing and supporting because we're all works in progress and we want somebody that will see us that way and not want to keep us um, on mute or keep us in a certain job or in a certain role. So you really have to drop into your heart and be very specific about the way you will feel when you have the partner of your deepest desires. Write it out. But leave the details of who, what, and when up to serendipity. You'll be surprised. Focus on the state you want to experience, not the criteria. The guy or girl might be less than a media standard 10, but heaven's own answer to the joy and ecstasy that is the natural state of partnership. In other words, don't set a visual of what they might look like or what kind of job they may have or how much money they make. Focus on how you want to feel in their arms or in their gaze, or when you share your deepest secrets. When you finally meet a person, they may be more or less handsome or beautiful than you imagined, poorer or richer than you wished, older or younger than you expected. But one thing is for sure, they'll be perfect for you, and then the details won't even matter. On the other hand, thriving love relationships do not compromise values, so stay true to yourself. And this might sound like a contradiction to the last point, but it's not. Be willing to love unconditionally so that you might be loved unconditionally in return. True love is about mutual respect and support and the understanding that each of you is on an individual path of personal growth and your love for one another creates a sanctuary of trust. True love allows us to be our most vulnerable self to be seen and embraced for who we are in our essence at whatever stage of our evolution we are in. When Aitken and I first met, it was too soon after my husband's death to consider a relationship and too soon after a bad ending to a relationship for Aitken to be interested in anything long-term. He was off on a Caribbean adventure. Neither of us was interested in romance, nor would we have picked out, been picked out as a pair My husband was best described as a white dinner jacket and martini kind of guy, while eighth in his blue jeans and untucked shirts. The odd thing was, 15 years apart, they grew up in the same neighborhood. They had the same teachers that told the same and told the same neighborhood stories. And they also share a generosity of spirit and a way of living from the heart that make them unique. When this happened, I just... You just don't say to God or the universe, you know, call me in six months or call me, you know, when he got a job or call me when she's uh, lost 20 pounds. You say, thank you. Thank you for the feeling I have when I'm in this person's presence and see myself in their eyes. 
Then again, not every loving relationship is meant to be forever. Sometimes you have to be with partners that are not meant to be long-term in order to find something out about yourself to prepare for the life partner you desire. This is no less love and should not be judged or treated as lesser love. I think too often we try to make one of these relationships into a long-term love and then it fails and fails and we feel we're a failure, but actually we're getting closer to the one that we truly desire. And Ethan continues to say, so far, so good. (laughs) Yeah, that's definitely a level of maturity in a relationship. Um, I've read Exhilarated Life twice and still often pick up your book, get random pages, just to get a boost or to be reminded of the lessons. What was it like, you know, to write your books and to share such personal stories in your book? Well, the writing was my own therapy to digest situations and work my way through and eventually constructing my own applied philosophy. And somewhat surprised, I found that others benefited when I shared my stories from my perspective because they could apply the principles to their own situations and comments on my blog would be that it was just the right words at the right moment for whatever the reader reader had been challenged by. And I think too often in the books that I was seeking out and reading to be helped through my transition have the, have a formula or they have the, the solution. And I just, I understood the solution. Yeah, I want to be enlightened. I want bliss. I want all that, but I just don't get it how I'm going to get that when my husband just died or when um, I can't sell my house or when the bank is down my back. I needed those steps. And so that's why I really felt I needed to be very deeply intimate with my own stories, tell the embarrassing details, talk about how um, unsure I was, how lost I was and how I found myself. I think we're governed by archetypal themes for sure. And while my own details are different from others, the challenges are global. They're the stuff of myths and fairy tales, the the human condition. Envy, greed, bullies, fear, anxiety, being lured by what appears pretty but is dangerous. Love, courage, adventure, trust, heroism. My personal story reads kind of like Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events and I didn't write my book for a long time because I didn't know how to express those. And these are stories of suicide, depression, death, financial loss, and starting over. But these are the content of my life and the threshing ground for the seeds of deeper understanding and my own happiness. They are not the context for my life. Through it all, I had an insatiable drive to know peace and happiness. The book is not about the storm, but about the rainbow and the acceptance that the rainbow could not have occurred without the storm. The challenge really was to give the context in the first parts of the book, you can get there from here, which discuss my personal history, and to do that with objectivity rather than drama. That took nearly a year itself of rewrites. A very good editor, Brian e. Sutherland, lots of processing and releasing my own attachment to judgment regret, guilt, blame. Every time I would write, I would feel my boots getting sucked into the mud of old emotion. We can never really know the whys of things, but we can know our responses. This happened, and I felt that, period. It's actually an epiphany. Sorry. No, I was just going to ask you, actually, to tell us about Paris. Oh, well, we... It was a series of weird events that got us there because we had gone on another project. We had booked our ticket, but that fell through, and we had this ticket, couldn't cancel it, so we went anyway. And it was, I guess, getting away and getting into a city where everything was completely different. Our mantra was, Paris changes everything. And it was in that time that all of a sudden, it's like I rose above those circumstances, and it was kind of a bird's eye view And I realized the truth that we are only in control of our responses to life, not to other people's actions or responses, nor to the circumstances of life itself. 
It was then that I was able, and I started right there at our little tiny table in our little studio apartment to, to write the introduction that it now is, so that I could write in a general way and not get drawn into the emotion or to relive the pain, yet to be able to give enough detail so that the main context of the lessons could be understood. It was from this experience I could write from a detached point of view without suffering all over again. It is, after all, my story. And it is what has made me who I am. So I had to share it. Everybody else who is affected by these events has their own version of the story. And I learned that history is subjective and that subjectivity is not concrete, but has as many versions as there are participants and onlookers and variations of that according to mood and motivation. This was a very insightful time because then you realize that the past is not necessarily what you think it was. It's only your remembered interpretation of it through your filters or however you were feeling at that time. So it really doesn't have a, a grip on you. I've got to confess, though, when my book first went up on Amazon and I saw the look inside, it made me gasp because there it was, no turning back. I own it and it's mine. It also illustrated to me that we're never finished our process. We just get more aligned with our essential self and authentic offering and keep peeling away and discarding what covers our own light. It's not about uncovering the light in others or changing what is or was. I wanted to share my stories intimately because I wanted people to know that you can get there from here. You can be happy no matter what. I also remember that day um, when your book, Exhilarated Life, was listed on Amazon and me thinking, finally, it's here. (laughs) And now everyone can see the inside page and the cover page. Um, So yeah, a little bit of a different memory, but I obviously don't have that emotional attachment to or have lived through the stories that you've lived, Marilyn which I still find is such a gift that you were able to write this book and and share it with people. And knowing that, you know, that happiness is out there within our reach if we just make that choice. So we never finish our process. And I keep reminding myself that it's all about the journey as well as the journey of writing, editing, rewriting and rewriting again. It's, both the cleansing and sometimes challenging process. I'm sure every writer would agree. So then what were your influences that supported your journey through writing this book? Well, sometimes I forget to remember what I know and I get caught in the drama myself. And when I do, people close to me tell me I should read my own book. (laughs) I always look for healing words or practices to help me regain my own equilibrium. But one of the most important things that I want to stress is that, and to share the strategies for wellness with you because of my absolute conviction that the harmonic of body, mind, and spirit is essential to our optimum life expression and our potential for happiness. And I don't mean a perfect body. I don't mean winning or running the Olympics or competing. I mean being in balance and well and nourishing our body in whatever state it's in. I read widely on philosophy and psychology, spirituality, ethics, business, and art. And when I'm challenged or down, as we inevitably are from time to time, I choose to read empowering writing to distract my mind from the game of repetition, because we all know when our mind gets hold of something, it is nearly impossible to stop that. How stupid you were, how lame you are, that person shouldn't have done that. And sometimes you just need to find somebody else to help you out of that mire. And I continue to do the workshops and online seminars and such things as posture, meditation, body alignment, because I really believe our body is our experiencer And the more aligned it is, the more we can manage our emotions and our expression in life. 
I use therapies regularly to keep my body clear of residual effects of both physical and emotional stresses, which I discussed earlier, and to align myself spiritually. I work with the most experienced practitioners I can find and personally rely on shiatsu, aromatherapy, flower essences, crystal therapies, Feldenkrais, Qigong, and lots of others. And recently in L.A., I had the really interesting experience of rolfing or structural integration, and it freed the scar tissue from a surgery over 30 years ago, which had affected my whole body balance and way of walking, which caused neck and shoulder problems. Funnily enough, after my treatment, I attended a hot yoga class and discovered on the first balancing pose of the tree, which I've done for years, I could hardly lift one foot up without losing my balance. My body was trying to realign decades of compensation. The next day, I nailed the tree pose and was easy into the eagle pose. My body just needed rebooting. And we don't realize how much memory our body has. And another awareness I had was when I was doing that dreaded video, uh, when I would look at the takes and trying to smile and be, you know, uh, convey a message, I could see... Um, the corners of my mouth turned down. I could see a frown on my face and realize that so much of my perhaps fear and anxiety was showing or my uncertainty at, at moving forward through this. And what we have to realize, is especially as we're um, as people are doing Botox and all this other stuff to change their face, we, we have to understand that the residual emotion shows in our face first. And if we can relax that, if we can let go of emotion, then we can see that the wellness starts coming from within us out and shows in our body. I have a daily reg- regimen of yoga and, well, if not daily, it's regular kind of. And uh, when I can, I do yoga classes uh, with other groups. And I keep my body stretched and nimble. And, of course, yoga invigorates the organs and and Ethan and I love walking because it greases the outdoor life here in the mountains on our little island. I also get a great deal of uh, rejuvenation from nature because it's a living meditation, and I tune in as much as possible. I don't have a meditative practice, but I do tune in to nature and the variety and beauty that surrounds me, And even if it's a bunch of tulips in a supermarket or my gorgeous ever-changing sea outside our window. And this instills the appreciation and gratitude, which is the bedrock of happiness, I think. Again, I put nutrition first, the body. If the body's in good nick, then then our our moods are better. And as much as possible, I eat natural organic foods, high percentage of vegetables and legumes supplemented with fruit, meats, and grains. And I make sure I drink lots of water, the best water I can find, which is uh, for brain function. Rest is key and to manage life's inevitable challenges with clarity and imagination and for me essential to my creative process. I simply cannot write if I am tired. Breathing is such a critical thing for us, much more than exchanging oxygen. Deep conscious breathing daily oxygenates the blood, revitalizes energy, clears and calms the mind. You'll sleep better. You'll feel better. Those little aches and pains, those stresses in your body you'll find miraculously are alleviated when you start a deep breathing practice. It's one of the one practice that has the most far-reaching healing and restorative benefits and we just take it so much for granted. And I also release regularly all that does not serve my well-being and happiness. This is constant vigilance as I said before. That includes thoughts, habits, people. And it may take me a while to process the junk when I come up against negativity or people that are just chaotic because I get drawn in. Just, Of course I get drawn in. And I get to let it go eventually because I know that to hang on to it only hurts me. We all need a support team. And this changes as we change, but is always essential to our continued evolution and personal fulfillment. I am, like everyone else, a continuing work in progress. And I give myself every chance to be as well as I can be. Ain't that the truth? 
a continued work of process we all are indeed. So thank you, Marilyn, for sharing such great tips on being unstuck, on, you know, feeling that we might be depressed and really searching and reaching for happiness. Now, how can we put all these themes, your lessons and tips and really living an exhilarated life into practice right now? I want to start right now. How do we do that? Hmm. (laughs) Well, that's a good exercise. Um, I think we know the seeds of our true essence are evident in our childhood. And I used to love to write poems and describe horses running in the surf of the sea and the way things in nature made me feel. And there was also the famous finger painting that I did in kindergarten of five outhouses. (laughs) I guess I was always concerned with letting go of what no longer serves us. Um, I'd love to everyone to think back about what really made them joyful as little children and, and see if they might get some messages for today. Um, send me a paragraph on par- Facebook and share what made you dance with delight. And are you doing it now? And if you are, how is it showing up? What a great exercise. I, When I was young, I loved setting up makeshift classrooms and teaching kids in our neighborhood. I would teach them about anything, anything that I knew. I loved writing the words You're to songs. You're teaching me that, now. <laughs> yeah, and I'm teaching now. Yes, and I love teaching. I loved writing you know, the words to songs that would play on the radio. And I love rearranging my bedroom every weekend. It made my parents crazy with our hardwood floors. And I shared a bedroom with my younger sister. And at times I would move the furniture while she was still sleeping. So she'd wake <laughs> up in a completely, you know, new room. It was so much fun because I think even then I knew I wanted to travel. I wanted to wake up in a different place, you know, and just experience life and experience everything that was new. I, I can't wait to get started on this exercise and really dig, you know, much deeper on other things that brought me joy as a child. And why not? Why not try to experience that right now, you know, and and put the plans in motion to try something new and wake up somewhere new every day. Yeah. Has your sister forgiven you? Yeah. No. And it's her birthday. (laughs) Traumatized birthday, Jen. No, and that's why I chose the career that I have today, because I can pretty much, you know, work from anywhere in the world that has internet. So, yeah, looks like I I did pretty well on my path to happiness. I still have a long way to go, but I, you know, I'm going to pat myself on the back. I did pretty well. So isn't that the joy of it? If we were, if we had arrived, what fun would there be? Oh, absolutely. There'd be nothing to look forward to if we felt that we had arrived. Another adventure. Yeah. Yes, an adventure. Hmm. Hmm. That's my theme for the weekend. My adventure. Actually, I am not shy to ever share my age. So I'm going to be turning 50 um, next year. And one of my friends had this really great project that she created for herself. She set out to have 50 adventures before she turned 50. And that was so inspirational to me. And I'm thinking about doing that. And these adventures could be anything. They could be, you know, expensive adventures, free Coming to Greece. Maybe coming to Greece. There you go. (laughs) On your little island. Yeah, that's an adventure. (sighs) Yes. And, and, you know, Mia with her crystal blue water that she's dying to see. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, maybe a a trip to Greece is in in the works. So for everyone who's listening, um, we want to hear from you. We want to hear from you if you're listening to this call live or to the recording. Please share your childhood joyful stories with us on Facebook at facebook.com Exhilarated Life. And if you have any other questions related to this interview or Exhilarated Life book, please also post them on the Facebook page. Again, if you have a more private question, go ahead and send Marilyn a message through Exhilarated Life Facebook page. Now, to say goodbye, <laughs> on behalf of Marilyn yeah. and myself, I don't want to say goodbye. I'm enjoying this I don't so want to either. I had no idea this was going to be so difficult. It was such a pleasure to be with everyone. And thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing this time with me and Lisa. And I would like to thank you for everyone who's been on this call, including Marilyn, for sharing your valuable time with us today. We trust that you had a thoughtful and inspiring experience 
if you'd like to listen to the interview again or share it with your friends. We would love that. And we'll be posting the replay on Marilyn's website at exhiliratedlife.com, where you can also find the links to purchase her book and hear so much more about her stories and her wonderful anecdotes. So Exhilarated Life Happiness Ever After book is available in paperback, hardcover, and digital. And also keep your eyes open for the Exhilarated Life Journal, which I can't wait to get my hands on. And mm. more goodies Marilyn has planned for in the next few months, including a private and group coaching program. Please do stay in contact by liking the Exhilarated Life Facebook page and by connecting with Marilyn on Twitter if you're on Twitter. And she's at Marilyn Harding. You'll also find links to her other social networks on her website. Again, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. And I wish you all a terrific and miraculous weekend. Thank you. Yeah, Sue. Thanks, everybody.